So tonight, the topic is the theology of the body lived, or as you see it here, the theology of the body in everyday life. So John and Claire Grabowski have been married for 34 years, have five children and three grandchildren. They have done pre-Cana marriage ministry together for almost 25 years and post-Cana ministry for nine years and served as a member couple from the United States on the Pontifical Council for the Family after their appointment by Pope Benedict XVI in 2009. Together they are the authors of the commentary on the anniversary edition of Familiaris Consortio and One Body, a program of marriage formation for the new evangelization, which came out last year. Their latest book, Raising Catholic Kids for Their Vocations, is available from TAN Books as of June 2019, so just out. They have spoken together to groups of laity, priests, and bishops from across the United States, and they are regular guests on the Greg and Lisa Popchek More to Life show on EWTN Radio. I also was very privileged to have Dr. John Grabowski for a professor when I was in seminary, and he was one of the, the best, and the classes was one of the best. Uh, he has a real gift. He, he knows scripture very well. He knows the history of the church well, and uh, the fathers of the church. He knows St. Thomas Aquinas, a good big plus for Dominicans. Um, well, uh, he's an expert in John Paul II's theology of the body. He has a lot of experience in marriage and family. I've, I've not met uh, Claire until tonight, but I'm really looking forward to, to hearing them together in this talk. And I know you are as well. So please welcome John and Claire Grabowski. So the fact that Father Hyacinth invited me here after having lived through one of my classes some 10 years ago <laughs> speaks very highly of his charity. I don't, I don't know about his judgment, but definitely his charity, which is the most important of the virtues, of course. Um, but fortunately for all of you and for me, um, I'm accompanied here tonight by my wife, Claire, um, and after I talk a little bit in general terms about the theology of the body at the beginning, I'm going to invite her up um, with me and we're going to share a little bit of our own experience of trying to live this beautiful teaching out with successes and failures over the years. Um, I might chime in a little bit on some of the experience. She might chime in a little bit on some of the theology, but this is kind of how we present when we present together. So first, I guess um, a question, how many of you have had previous exposure to the theology of the body? Raise your hand. Okay. Um, maybe about a quarter. How many of you have actually read some of the theology of the body? Some of John Paul II's catechetes. Okay, smaller number of hands. Good. So um, that's that's helpful for me to know because um, I think what Fa Father Hyacinth asked me to do is just give a little bit of orientation to the theology of the body to give you a sense of it, a kind of a, a little bit of an overview. And then again, we're going to share a little bit about our experience. So, what is the theology of the body? Um, Sometimes some of the presentations you will hear on this topic will kind of focus on the sexual aspects of the theology of the body, and certainly the theology of the body tells us a lot about what it means to be male and female, the, the gift of self, the vocation to marriage, the vocation to consecrated celibacy and religious life. But the theology of the body is much more than, um, as one uh, commentator puts it, a gospel of sex. Uh, it, the theology of the body is much richer than that. It is a biblical and iconic, we'll come back to iconic, hold that thought, anthropology that highlights our body's capacity to give and receive love at any age and in any state of life. So again, it's an anthropology. It's an understanding of the human person, who we are as human persons, how God designed us, 
um, in his plan. The theology of the body as we have it comes to us um, as we uh, invoked in our opening prayer from St. John Paul II. Um, it's he developed this teaching at the beginning of his very long, very fruitful pontificate um, in which he served the church. And one of the things I hope to just point out a little bit of as we go through tonight, um, the theology of the body remains a vital tool for the church, a tool for the new evangelization. Um, I was privileged to be at the 2015 Synod on Family. One of the questions that I I heard myself asking, a lot of the bishops there asking, where's the theology of the body? If you read Pope Francis's um, exhortation on the family of Morris Letizia, it is replete with the theology of the body. He draws on it deeply, richly, and repeatedly. And I want to highlight a few points of intersection because sometimes you'll hear reports in the media sometimes even the Catholic media, that there's daylight somehow between Pope Francis and John Paul II on some of these questions. And certainly in regard to the theology of the body, the indissolubility of marriage, that's not true. So what were, what is the theology of the body? What's its genesis? Um, how many of you have been to Rome? Okay. Um, so if you've been to Rome and you have been to one of the Pope's weekly general audiences, typically on Wednesday, right, um, the Holy Father will address the crowd from the balcony above St. Peter's Square, or if the weather's bad, um, in, in the Paul VI audience hall. Um, so St. John Paul II devoted five years at the beginning of his pontificate to unfolding this catechesis, which he actually called an adequate anthropology. Notice that, and um, it, it, that may not sound right to our ears, but um, the, the Italian for adequate um, has no connotation of being less than or lesser. Um, it means sufficient, um, up to the task of talking about the human person in the age following the sexual revolution, um, where we now find ourselves, the 20th century iteration of the sexual revolution. It actually began in the 19th century. So every Wednesday for five years, except when he was in the hospital recovering after the assassination attempt on his life, St. John Paul II gave a catechesis in Italian. Um, we now know that they were actually written in Polish <clears throat> um, before his elevation to the papacy. He would have probably made them available in some form. We don't know how as the Cardinal Archbishop of Krakow. However, um, unexpectedly, after the election and sudden death of, of John Paul I, Cardinal Wojtyla was elevated to the chair of Peter, so he took this material he already had in Polish, translated it in, into Italian, and delivered it over the course of five years. Now, papal catechesis, when it's given, it's, in this case, the original language is Italian. It's translated into different languages by the staff of the Vatican newspaper, L'Osservatore Romano. So the English staff of L'Osservatore Romano did the original translation, which means that it was translation by a committee done over five years, which means that one word in Italian might be translated one way in one place and a very different way somewhere else. So the translation is uneven. Um, there was a lot of interest in the theology of the body. The Daughters of St. Paul gathered them, these catechesis together into four volumes, published them in the early and mid-1980s. Um, but the interest continued and kind of snowballed over time. So in, 19, in the mid-1990s, the Daughters of St. Paul decided, we're going to gather these four volumes into one, um, and we're going to include... Pope Paul VI encyclical letter, Humanae Vitae, which was one of the catalysts for the catechesis, and some of John Paul II's more authoritative teaching, his apostolic letter on women, Molieris Dignitatum, um, his encyclical Evangelium Vitae on the Gospel of Life. So all of that single, single volume, I, I really particularly like the forward in this one. Um, I don't know if you can see that, but um, yeah, it's anyway. Um, but still, the, the, the uneven translation. So so in 2006, Mikhail Waldstein, um, a biblical scholar who was at Ave Maria until recently, now he's at Franciscan University in Steubenville, did a new translation from the original Italian, checked against the Polish, added some material that wasn't actually delivered, 
um, by John Paul II, just so people could get a fuller sense, and published it in this volume, Man and Woman, he created them. If you really want to do serious study of the theology of the body, this is, this is the volume to get. This is the, the translation to work, work with, as my students will tell you. Um, what St. John, what John Paul II really does in the catechesis, and this is actually not just the theology of the body, this is the way John Paul II, throughout his pontificate, reads scripture. In his previous lifetime, before he was Bishop of Rome, um, John Paul II, as a young priest, was actually um, a playwright um, and an actor, uh, as a seminarian even, um, and then was trained as a professional philosopher and actually taught philosophy for years at the University of Lublin, Krakow in Poland, um, in addition to being a priest, then bishop, then archbishop, then cardinal archbishop. What St. John Paul II does is draw on his training as a philosopher. He was trained in a method of philosophy called phenomenology, which is a way of reflecting on human experience. And he uses that training when he re reads scripture to break open the biblical text and allow the experience that the text is describing to illuminate ourselves and our own experience. Um, Bishop Wojtyla served at the Second Vatican Council um, and the council's teaching that Christ fully reveals us to ourselves in its pastoral constitution on the church had an incredibly profound impression on him. He was one of the drafters of that document of Gaudium et Spes, but um, he carried that with him um, and reflected on it and prayed on it. So for John Paul II, when we read scripture, and we understand the tech, the, what the experience the text is mediating, it teaches us about ourselves, about our own experience. And that's really what the theology of the body is. It's a biblical reflection meditation on the human person, male and female, in the image of God. All of you are, I'm sure, familiar with icons, right? An icon is a theological and artistic representation that makes a mystery of the faith accessible in a visual form. Um, <clears throat> Claire actually did an icon uh, drawing class some years ago, and, and one of the things we learned when she did that is you don't actually paint an icon, you write an icon. Because it's, again, it's a theological statement. Um, when an icon has more than one panel, you, if it's a two panel icon, it's a diptych. When it has three panels, as this one does, it's called a triptych. In this case, we have Christ the Savior flanked by the Blessed Mother and St. John the Baptist, pointing to Christ as the heart of uh, the mystery of salvation. So remember I said at the beginning, the theology of the body is an iconic anthropology. This is what I meant. John Paul II, when he reflects on the human person through the lens of scripture, draws on the three panels, if you will, the three mysteries of creation, sin, and our redemption in Christ to understand and present the human person. Um, and so each of these panels of his triptych is introduced by a reflection of our Lord in the Gospels, um, Jesus' dialogue with the Pharisees on the indissolubility of marriage sends him back to the opening chapters of Genesis. Um, Jesus is teaching in the Sermon on the Mount about the lustful look, committing adultery in one's heart, leads him to a reflection on the mystery of sin and the way in which sin has disfigured our capacity to love. And then Jesus' words to the Sadducees on the resurrection of the body and marriage um, leads him into a reflection on the grace of redemption and how we are healed, elevated, and transformed through redemption. Um, and again, I can't do justice to this in this short period. Um, I'm going to give you some suggestions if you want to dig a little deeper, some resources. But um, just to take these words and maybe give you some sense. So the panel on your left, the creation panel, these three titles refer to what he calls three original experiences. 
that the second story of creation, Genesis 2, disclosed to us. So God creates the man, places him in the garden. Um, the man gives name to the, names to the animals. John Paul points out that he becomes aware that his existence is a gift because of all the creatures he encounters, and he encounters animals who are creatures of God, who have value and purpose, but they can't think. They can't choose. They're not persons. They're not self-aware subjects. So he becomes aware in his solitude that his existence is unique. It's a gift. And he's called to return himself in gratitude and obedience to his creator. But he also experiences something else. Genesis 2.18, it is not good for the man to be alone. He longs for another person with whom he can share himself, not just animals whom he can relate to, but another human person. So God casts this deep sleep on the man, and while he's asleep, he takes out one of his ribs, builds it up into a woman, leads her to the man, and coming out of his covenant sleep, the man says, this one is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, because out of her man, this one's been taken. John Paul says, the man rejoices because now he's met another body that expresses the person, a body that mediates the ability to choose, to think, to love. And for the first time, he recognizes the meaning of his own body in hers. And it's, it's right there in the Hebrew text. The man says, this one is Isha, because out of Ish, she's been taken. This is woman, so I'm, oh, I'm man. For the first time, he understands the meaning of his own embodiment. So sexual difference is nuptial, it's spousal. It orders us toward each other. We, uh, the meaning of femininity is disclosed in masculinity. The meaning of masculinity is disclosed in femininity. She discovers the meaning of her own existence in woman in him. And both of them, of course, are ordered to the gift of selves by their creator. Um, so this is the experience of original unity, the discovery of the spousal meaning of the body, giving oneself in love and that culminates in the covenant of marriage and the bodily gift of self. And this is an idea that we'll return to over and over tonight. John Paul says over and over, the body expresses the person. To give one's body is to give oneself because our bodies are an integral part of who we are. But sin disrupts every one of those original experiences. Sin introduces a rupture between our bodies and our ability to think, to choose, and to give ourselves in love. Um, he says it's almost a constitutive break in our original psychosomatic unity, and it unleashes this drive in us called, which the tradition calls concupiscence, which causes us to try to find our happiness in everything except the one thing that can make us happy, which is God. Um, so we and try to find our happiness in things, in pleasure, in power, in all of these created things. Um, sin breaks the original relationship between man and woman, uh, unleashing this, this struggle for power and control. God's words to the woman in Genesis 3.16, your desire will be for your husband and he will lord it over you. John Paul says that's the result of sin. That struggle for power, that oppression of women by men, think of the Me Too movement, right? That's the result of sin. That's not God's plan for the way we would relate. And it unleashes in the human heart a disordering of the natural attraction we have toward one another, which we call lust or inordinate desire. And lust is the propensity of fallen men and women to see others around them not as persons made in the image and likeness of God, but as objects, as a something, not a someone, something I can use to satisfy myself sexually, emotionally, Men and women, men are more inclined to use sexually, women more inclined to use emotionally, but we both have this broken propensity within us. 
But of course, the story doesn't stop there. And John Paul II reads into the New Testament and talks about the grace of redemption, which isn't just something we, exp we experience it perfectly, yes, in the beatific vision, when we see God face to face, but we experience the healing effects of Christ and the mystery of salvation now here. So when he speaks of the redemption of the body, it's not just what happens after we die, what happens at the resurrection of the body. It's the healing work of grace in our lives now through prayer, through experiencing the sacraments. We'll talk, we'll touch on this tonight. It's the healing of the relationship between man and woman so that it's not a struggle for power but it's each living for the good of the other. What St. Paul in Ephesians 5.21 says, be subordinate to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives to your husbands and husbands love your wives. That's what the Christian, Christian marriage, the Christian household is supposed to look like. And grace makes it possible again. Yeah, and this is a prog All of these things, by the way, are progressive. They happen over our lifetime, right? This is growth in holiness. This is growth in sanctification. But grace makes it possible so that we can love and not use the people around us, the people whom God puts in our lives. So that's the Reader's Digest condensed version of the theology of the body, okay? You just got in 20 minutes what my doctoral students and I spend a whole semester doing and we realize at the end, we've only scratched the surface, right? So there's, there's so much here. If you want to dig a little deeper, um, let me mention some resources that will give you a good launching point, a good starting point for understanding this beautiful teaching. Mary Healy, um, an excellent biblical scholar herself, wrote a wonderful short book, Men and Women Are From Eden. Uh, it's great for Bible studies or um, a discussion group. She has discussion questions at the end of each chapter. She walks you through the theology of the body, gives you a really nice, um, concise overview, and then helps you dig deeper both into the John Paul's teaching and scripture, because that's Mary's gift. She is a wonderful biblical scholar. Um, called to Love by Carl Anderson and Father Jose Granados, um, a nice overview of the theology of the body as a whole. And then Emily Stimson, These Beautiful Bones, an Everyday Theology of the Body, which is kind of what we're going to be talking and sharing a little bit about tonight, how the theology of the body intersects with our everyday life as a married couple, as parents, as, as families. And as Emily says very well in her book and shows very well in her book, the theology of the body is not just about the bedroom. The theology of the body is what happens in all of the rooms of a couple's house, all of the rooms of a family's house. And that's what we're going to be sharing a bit about here. So the rest of um, our time here tonight, we're going to be talking about some kind of implications and we'll be at times dipping back to take an idea or a text from the catechesis, but then using that as a springboard to talk a little bit about our own experience. Um, Father Hyacinth, when he introduced us, mentioned that Claire and I have done a lot of marriage preparation over the years, so almost for 25 years or so, we've been working with couples. But one of the things that is always a joy to be able to explain to couples as we accompany them in their preparation is that in the church's understanding, sex is actually sacramental. And I don't mean that in just a loose sense. I mean it actually in a very technical sense, right? Because in the Western Latin church, Pope Francis points this out in Amoris Laetitia, our understanding is it's the baptized couple who marry each other. The priest, sorry fathers, we have a couple of priests with us, is just an official witness on behalf of the church. He is, as one scholar of canon law puts it, theologically expendable. He's not doing anything. He's there to receive and witness the couple's consent on behalf of the church. So the couple are the ministers of the sacrament. They marry each other, but that consent does not become indissoluble, unbreakable until what? Sexual consummation occurs. Canon law says consummation in a human manner. What is that? A manner apt for the generation of children. 
Again, the body expresses the person. To give the body is to give oneself. So a couple makes a promise in their vows to give themselves. But when they come together as one flesh in sexual intercourse, now that that promise has been enacted. It's been sealed, at least in an initial sense. Of course, it's going to deepen over the course of their lives. So the theology of the body gives us a re Why does the church see sex in this light? Because it's an integral part of the way in which God designed us to love. That we don't love as disembodied beings. We love as embodied beings. To love is to give oneself. John Paul II talks about how the body itself is a gift. He writes, the body which expresses femininity for masculinity and vice versa, masculinity for femininity, manifests the reciprocity and communion of persons. It expresses it through gift as the fundamental characteristic of personal existence. This is the body, a witness to creation as fundamental gift and therefore a witness to love as the source from which this giving springs. So, to understand our bodies rightly, we have to understand that they are a gift given to us by God. But we discover the meaning of our bodies when we give them as gift. And I'm going to invite my, my wife up here to join me. You're, going to, you're getting tired of listening to just me, so this is going to get a lot better, I promise. Hi, everybody. So... Um, in our new book, Raising Children, Catholic Children for Their Vocation, we really talk about the importance of having religious priests, nuns, brothers as part of your life. Um, how are people supposed to know what the other vocations are like if they haven't met people who are priests or nuns or sisters? It's really important. And um, I actually had the privilege about a month ago, maybe a little over, to be part of a um, women's leaders retreat where <laughs> called Given, and it was run. It was it was run by the Sisters of Life, but we had mentoring groups, and each group had a lay married woman or a single woman, and a sister in it, so that together we mentored these young women who were seeking to know you know, to discern their vocations, to discern their <clears throat> future occupations. And it, I found it such a blessing to be able to do this with a sister. I had never met the sister, but we connected so easily. And I realized, you know what, we're not that different. We all, we both desire to be holy and we both desire to help bring others to holiness and to heaven. So I think it's really important that you include these in your family life. You know, we have a couple of dear friends that I'll talk about in a little while that are regular parts of our family. They come over and they even play games with our kids. And our kids are grown. We have children in their late 20s and 30s. And we just, you know, it's just part of our life. And it, it, I think it was really important for them to see that you don't have to be just like mom and dad. You don't have to, you know, get married. It's a, good thing. It's a wonderful thing. I mean, I highly recommend it. But there are other vocations, and we need to let our let people know what they're like. It's very important. So, in the church's understanding, <clears throat> marriage and consecrated virginity, celibacy, are not competitive vocations. Right. They're complementary vocations. And notice again, we're coming at this through the lens of the theology of the body. They're both ways in which the body expresses the person. You make a gift of yourself through your body as a man or a woman. Right. You enter into marriage. You enter into religious life, priesthood. So both of them affirm the fact that we're called to love through giving ourselves. And that gift includes our embodied selves. So um, <clears throat> this is a picture of our three grandchildren. Aren't they adorable? <laughs> so... Well, um, whenever I do a PowerPoint, they somehow photobomb it. So I just, I just go with it. <laughs> so, um, but um, John and I have really found that, especially in today's world, in this culture, it's important to talk about and form children to know what chastity is. Because, you know, at least when we were young, everything didn't center on the lack of chastity. But nowadays, the world does. 
And if someone, if we're not teaching our children and and our culture what it is, nobody's going to. But it's really important. I remember when our kids were little, we um, made sure they went to every single theology of the body talk there was. You know, I was taking them to all different conferences and. Um, John taught it, so we would talk about it at home. It got to a point where the kids were like, no more. We, we could teach this, but, you know, we felt it was really important. And we were like, you know, th this is what we're going to do. We're going to plant the seeds we can, and if you don't want to follow it later on in life, you don't have to, but we're grateful that they did. But So now we are privileged to be able to be doing this with our grandchildren. Our son and daughter-in-law um, are both committed Catholics, and... Um, love life and we are able to support them and and be witnesses to our grandchildren as well as our children i remember one particular time when our kids said something to claire to the effect <coughs> mom we don't have to go to that talk we could give that talk and the response was okay maybe someday you will now get in the car <laughs> right um but I, I just want to point out here, notice this quote. This is actually Pope Francis in Amoris Laetitia. The language of the body calls for a patient apprenticeship in learning to interpret and channel desires in view of authentic self-giving and growth in chastity by the young. He's paraphrasing his predecessor, St. John Paul II, the theology of the body. The language of the body is a term drawn directly out of John Paul II's catechesis, and we'll try to unpack that a little bit more as we move forward. So again, don't buy the story that's out there about the daylight between Pope Francis and John Paul II, um, certainly in regard to the theology of the body. Um, so we mentioned that we've been doing marriage preparation for it's been over 25 years, and the reason why we keep doing it is because every time we work with a couple, we do it individually, usually one or two a year, and every time we work with a couple, it helps our marriage. You know, it's, it really is in giving that you receive, and, and um, we love doing it so much that we wrote our own book because we just felt like there wasn't anything out there that really had everything that we wanted to share. So. So this is our book. We actually have this book and the other book on raising children with us, if anyone wants to buy them later. But um, this came out about, as Father said, about a year ago. And um, up here in the corner is our son, Paul, and his wife. They've been married for six years now, and those three kids were theirs. And um, <clears throat> it was really cool um, because when they got engaged, they asked John and I to do their marriage preparation. And we were, we couldn't believe it. I know. Can, <laughs> <laughs> what were they thinking? But, and we actually asked them, you know, when we first met, we said, why did you ask us? And Paul said, Mom, you know, I, I see what you and Dad have, and that's what I want for my marriage. So, you know, it's, it's our responsibility to share the joy, the joy and gift of marriage, the, sh the joy of knowing the Lord. And, um, letting him transform our lives. So we were very blessed to be able to do, to do their marriage preparation and um, just love that we, we were able to get to know them in this way. So again, the, <clears throat> connecting back to the, the theology of the body. So again, in entering into religious life in um, the sacrament of holy orders, it's a bodily gift of self. You promise your whole self. You give yourself as a man or a woman. Same is true in marriage, right? It's, it's the expression of consent, promising the whole of yourself, the whole of your life, but then that's enacted bodily. It's for this reason, in part, that the church recommends that the rite of marriage take place within the context of the Mass, within the context of the liturgy, because then you have what St. John Paul II and St. Paul actually call both sides of the great mystery. The mystery of Christ the bridegroom giving himself for and to his bride, the church, giving his body and blood, um, and a man and woman who are an icon of that gift, that relationship between Christ and the church, giving themselves to each other. So when you have the rite of marriage in the context of a wedding mass, you have the, in a sense, the spotlight 
of the heart of the mystery of salvation, Christ's gift of himself to the Eucharist, shining on and shining through that couple and the, and the exchange of consent that they share. One of the other things that is, I love to share with young couples who are about to get married is the importance of knowing that when you get married in the church, it's a sacrament. And there is grace poured out in that sacrament. And, you know, marriage is not easy. It's a lot of work. It's scary. <laughs> um, raising children is not easy. But when you choose to let the Lord be part of that marriage, when you get married with the sacrament, there's grace poured out there to help you. There's grace poured out there for your whole marriage over and over again. And it's renewed when you have your children baptized. God's there to help you raise those children. There's grace there. It's renewed when you go to Mass and receive the Eucharist, when you go to confession and repentance. There are so many opportunities for grace, and we are blessed. We're privileged to be able to have them. I really don't understand anyone who wouldn't want to get married in the church. There's so much grace there. Mar marriage is challenging. We're going to share a little bit more about that in, in a bit. One of our dear friends is fond of saying, you know, as Jesus says in the Gospels, take up your spouse and follow me. <laughs> because loving another person is painful. It's a death to say, for, I mean, Claire, she has to love me. I mean, that, wow. Actually, I talk I, about the need for grace. I'm the hard one. He's the <laughs> No, that's, that is so not true. Um, oh, another thing we um, talk about in marriage preparation is the different forms of intimacy. And there are actually four different um, parts of intimacy. One is verbal or emotional, talking, sharing about your life, sharing about your day. The next is physical, and this is not, not genital um, intimacy, but more like touch and um, holding hands. Giving a back rub. My personal favorite is having my feet rubbed. They, they always hurt. I just love having them rubbed. Um, then the next one is spiritual intimacy. I think this is the most important. Because if you aren't mm -hmm. intimate with your spouse in a spiritual way, if you don't pray together, if you don't go to Mass together, if you don't share about what God is doing in your life, pray over each other, you're, you're not sharing the, the most important part of yourselves. And these three types of intimacy are reflected in the, like a mirror, the, in sexual um, intimacy. And a lot of times when people say they're having problems in, in their sexual life, it's usually not that. It's usually they're not talking to each other, they're not praying together, they're not showing affection. But forgiving. Those are the most important, you know, you need them to have a healthy marriage. So if you want um, kind of a, uh, that same um, image a little bit more fully, this is actually a diagram that's in the book that Claire just mentioned, One Body. So sexual intimacy, a mirror reflecting back spiritual, physical, verbal, emotional. And by the way, it's a mirror and it really does work in both directions. Claire mentioned uh, problems in communication or in conflict mm -hmm. resolution or physical, t can show up as sexual problems in a marriage. But conversely, when a couple is actually communicating well, is actually being affectionate, is actually praying together. We have decades of social scientific mm -hmm. research that shows us that couples who pray together on a regular basis enjoy their sexual relationship far more than couples who don't. They have sex more frequently and they enjoy it more. Why? Because if you can open your hearts together to the creator of the universe, then sharing your body with each other is not that difficult. Right, because that's the most intimate thing you can do. So it's kind of a virtuous feedback loop of, of, that works within a marriage when it's functioning well. And all of this is governed by, ordered by, the virtue of chastity. Chastity is the virtue that enables us to love fully and to love well in whatever state in life we live. Whether we're single, we're celibate, we're married. married when you get married, you don't graduate from chastity. You live chastity in a new way. You live chastity in the form of fidelity to your spouse, um, ordering your sexual relationship toward the two fundamental goods. We've said this in the opening prayer, the union or expression of mutual love and self-gift and openness to life, procreation, the gift of children. So chastity is the virtue that help, 
and again, it's, it's, this isn't something that's instantaneous. The grace of the sacraments, we have to cooperate with that grace. We have to work at it. So growing in virtue is something that happens over time, and we fail, we fall short. That's why we have repentance and the sacrament of reconciliation when we do, so that we can <clears throat> recommit ourselves and start growing again. <clears throat> So um, I don't know if you, any of you know this, but this is, well, last week was um, NFP Awareness Week. So um, I'm, I'm new to Instagram, and I have an Instagram account because I'm trying to promote our, our books and stuff. But I was reading a lot of people who spoke about um, their fertility and NFP, and, and I have to agree with them that understanding your fertility really by using NFP really helps you to cooperate and to work with it and to, you know, to, to let God give you the family that he wants to give you. And you know, I have to admit, you know, I, when John and I first got married, we were very young and we had time to have a lot of children. We thought we were going to have 10, 12 children, but it didn't turn out that way. We, we were blessed with five beautiful children over a course of, of 13 years. And um, we're so grateful, but it, it really helps to understand your fertility and, and be aware so God can bless you with the children that he wants to. Um, let me think. When we, when we do marriage preparation, we encourage couples to learn it before they get married so that you can be aware of your body and you can talk about it and you can, you can learn to work with your fertility. And um, just because you get married young doesn't mean you're going to have a lot of children, as you see with me. Uh, or you get married old, or you're not going to have many. We have a friend who we went to college with. So we were married at 21 and 22. And this... this um, I was 22. He was 22. I was the, <laughs> I was the mature one. <laughs> but we had a friend. He happened to be at our wedding. And he did not get married till he was 40. And he married a girl who was in her mid-30s. He was in his mid-40s. And um, so he's our age now. We're 55, and thank God we started young because our five children are grown. And his five children are under 12. So, you know, God works in different ways. But they were aware of their fertility, and they allowed God to bless them with children. And even though it's harder having them when you're older, they are they were rejoicing that they Wonderful. were able to have five children. Wonderful family. So, and then there's those who get married and expect to get pregnant immediately. That's not always the way God has planned either. You know, I have, we have other couples we've worked with who are so excited and they're so pro-life and, you know, they come back to us a year or two later and, is something wrong? What, you know, we've been trying and, you know, and we encourage them, just be patient, you know, know that God has a plan for you and, and, and trust. And, and, and sometimes it's time to get help and, um, but, Knowing your fertility and doing NFP is a real blessing because it helps you cooperate with God. Right. And for couples who have limited fertility, there is NAPRO technology which can help them uh, help heal whatever dysfunction um, in the body is causing. Infer infertility is not a disease, it's actually a symptom. So NAPRO actually tries to heal the disease of which fertility is a symptom so that a couple can then get pregnant naturally. And of course, there are couples who just can't right they're they're simply infertile um and as pope john paul pointed out as pope francis points out there's adoption exactly. which is another beautiful way to express the fruitfulness of mutual love within marriage and we have dear friends who have adopted four or five or six children and they have beautiful families and they love those children every bit as much as if they had had their own uh, physical children so the church is teaching reminds us that fertility is not a disease. Right. It's not something we have to suppress through chemicals, through surgery, through me mechanical devices. What a lot of people don't think about, but there are some women theologians who have pointed this out, and I think it's important. It is interesting to think about the fact that most contraception aims at suppressing the unique fertility of women, right? It aims to make women potentially uh, permanently sterile, at least for a period of time. Why? So they're more sexually available to men. Instead of cooperating with the unique pattern of a woman's fertility, understanding it, working with it, understanding God's design. Many people also don't realize 
the health risks for women that are associated with many forms of contraception, even current low-dose oral contraceptions, still a class one carcinogen. Um, they also have all kinds of risk of increased um, cardiovascular problems for women. Um, other contraceptives have other um, health <coughs> risks attached to them. So in some cases, one of the things, we were at a family symposium at Notre Dame a, year, a week and a half ago. ago, and one of the things the data is starting to show is a lot of millennials are taking another look at natural family planning because they don't want to put toxic things into their body and they want to care for their the environment of their body and the environment of the world around them. So uh, fertility-based methods of family planning do that. St. John Paul II, um, in explaining why the church sees a moral difference between using some form of natural family planning to cooperate with the gift of fertility and contraception, <clears throat> pointed out well, one, of course, as, as Claire alluded to a moment ago, natural family planning can help couples become pregnant. And we'll share a little bit of our own experience there. Um, and not just postpone becoming pregnant, right? So in, in that sense, it's really a method of family planning. Contraception only works in one direction, to negate or suppress fertility. But John Paul gave a deeper explanation. He said, Again, the body is naturally communicable. The body expresses in its masculinity, femininity, our call, our vocation to love. So when a couple engages in sexual intercourse, even if they don't say anything, they're speaking a very profound language to each other. They're speaking a language of total self-gift. In a sense, it, they're speaking what they spoke to one another in their wedding vows. I take you to be my husband, my wife. I promise to be true to you in good times and bad, in sickness and health. I will love and honor you all the days of my life. So when a couple engages in sexual union, that's what, they're, that's what their bodies are saying to one another. So what happens when a couple uses some form of contraception, either before, during, or after? sexual intercourse, depending on the method used. It's as if they were saying, I give myself to you, but not my fertility. I accept you unconditioned, but not your fertility. I don't want that. So the language of total self-gift is negated by a language of withholding and rejection and refusal. And again, fertility isn't a disease, it's a gift. It's an integral part of who we are as men, or men and women. It's an integral part of God's design for us. Um, Claire mentioned last week was um, NFP Awareness Week. It was also the 51st anniversary of St. Paul VI encyclical letter on hum human life, Humani Vitae. Um, and again, um, certainly a lot of especially the last part of St. John Paul II's Catechesis on the Theology of the Body, is basically articulating uh, and ex explicating why did Pope Paul VI teach that there's an inseparable connection between life and love, union and procreation. Um, but again, just, just so you can hear this, because you might not hear it in other places, Pope Francis, is a strong advocate and defender of the teaching of St. Paul VI in Humani Vitae. Of course, he just presided over his predecessor's canonization. But in Amoris Laetitia, Pope Francis writes, from the outset, love refuses every impulse to close in on itself. It is open to a fruitfulness that draws it beyond itself. Hence, no genital act of husband and wife can refuse this meaning, even when for various reasons it may not always in fact beget new life. I've read statements from other theologians in other parts of the world who said, well, Pope Francis really hasn't said anything about humani vitae. And my response is, have you read Amoris Laetitia? What, what document are you reading if you're drawing that conclusion? So this is us um, when we were had our first two children. And, so, and by the way, I'm not really 12 in that picture. I just look like it, okay? Just want you to know that. And so, um, so we got married, like I said, right at, at, after graduation. Actually, two weeks before we graduated from college. And... Um, 
we had planned, uh, John was starting graduate school, at, and we had planned on, you know, waiting a little bit to, to start having children. But to our delight, um, God had different plans. So our daughter, Rachel, Rachel Elizabeth, was born two weeks before our first anniversary. And I had a terrible pregnancy. I, I have to tell you, I don't enjoy being pregnant. I, um, I had nine months of morning sickness. I had, um, I just felt like all the life was sucked out of me. And it, it even, even though, well, anyway, I don't love being pregnant, but at, we were in the hospital and we had had this baby and actually I enjoyed the delivery. I, I'm weird, but it, <laughs> it was a time when John, John, you know, came to the hospital. We had, he was there the whole time with me. It was just such a beautiful time. And they handed us this child, this child, is that me? And, um, we were just in awe. We couldn't believe what a gift she was. This was the greatest, the, the greatest thing God had given us. Just and um, all my morning sickness disappeared. I didn't, I didn't remember any of it. And I was like, John, we need to have more of these children. <laughs> we, we were so both of us. We both agreed, and so we started right, right away trying to have another one. And um, it turned out we didn't get pregnant again right away. It, we tried for nine months, and then we were like, do we have secondary infertility? And we um, actually learned, we, we, John was at Marquette, so we um, went back to the nursing department there, and um, a friend of ours now, um, Rick Faring, who actually started the Marquette method, he taught us a new method, the Creighton model, to help us get pregnant with our next child. And so three years after Rachel was born, this is our little Rebecca Ann. And, you know, I look back at those days and I'm like, oh my gosh, if we had been pregnant right away, we wouldn't have Rebecca. Hmm. You know, God knew. God knows exactly who he wants to give us. And, you know, we have to trust. But, but we became aware of our fertility and let God work through that. And he blessed us very much over the years. We had, um, so Rachel, Rachel was three years older than Becca. And then Paul was born 25 months later. And then Dan was born 22 months after Paul. And it's funny because I have my two girls. I, I'm, I have no, no sisters. I only have brothers. And I really wanted daughters. And God gave me my first two daughters. And I was so excited. I said, okay, God, I'll take a boy. <laughs> and, um, and I had a boy. And I have to tell you, he was so much joy. I, he just, he was the easiest baby, and God just blessed us through him, and I was like, God, I want another boy, and so he gave us Daniel, and um, we were so blessed, and, but as you can see, the kids are pretty old when we had Abby, so um, actually up there, that's Daniel at his baptism, and this is Abby at her six years later, they're six years apart, and we were so delighted that, because we tried to have Abby for quite a while. And we thought, well, we guess maybe we have inferti secondary infertility again, or fifth time for I don't know. But um, <laughs> Quintary. We we infertility. were we were delighted to find out that God gave us another child, and we had never found out what we were having beforehand. But we decided the kids wanted the kids wanted to know their baby's their baby sister that they went we that we all went to the sonogram and they got to see their baby sister. And then we went home and we started looking up names in the Bible and praying. And so this little girl's name is Abigail Grace. Abigail means the father rejoices. And Grace means gift. So her name means that she is a gift from God and he was rejoicing that we were having another child. And we just, you know, she, she complains about her name all the time. Why did you name me Abigail? <laughs> and we say, oh, because God rejoiced that you were a part of our family. So what, what a wonderful, wonderful. Okay. I'm so, also, also talking about you go first. Then I have, so, I have my little um, notes. Scientists, doctors tell us that the bonding between mothers and children happens long before birth, right? When a woman is pregnant, um, her body is in constant biochemical communication with the body of her unborn child whom she's carrying. So there are already, there's already a communication at a host of different levels. That bonding gets reinforced in labor because even though a woman goes through this exhausting and difficult process, 
as Claire shared, it's also there's this exhilaration, but part of the chemical rush that happens in a woman's body during labor is her body is flooded with neurotransmitters that are actually bonding agents um, that help her bond to the new little child she brings into the world. That Those bonds then get reinforced further through the physiological bonding of breastfeeding. And again, a woman who's breastfeeding her child, her body is producing neurotransmitters, some of the same ones that a woman experiences during sex. Because again, sex is a bodily gift of self. It bonds people together. Same thing happens during the process of nurturing a child. So Claire can speak a little. I can't say anything more. I can tell you about the science. I can tell you about the theology. I can't talk about the experience. John Paul II said, we need women to talk about these areas of the body and bodily experience because men don't have access to them. At the family symposium we were at at Notre Dame, we someone told a story of a man who got kicked out of the Leche League because he said that men can't nurse. No, it was a woman who got kicked out. Oh, yes. okay. But so apparently common sense is increasingly uncommon these right. days because that's just a biological fact. Exactly. But, but anyway, so um, yes, I don't enjoy being pregnant, but I do love knowing that there's life inside of me and feeling that life and and share, you know, I remember when Rachel would kick me or, you know, I first thing, oh, John, come here, come here. It's like, you know, it, I wanted to share it so, so much. And then with the other children, I wanted to share, you know, the next child coming and, and so they could bond with them. Even with our oldest, there is a way for the father to bond because I believe, and I know this, that they can, the babies can hear you. They really can. I, um, during our first pregnancy, because I was so sick, I, I went and taught, I came home and I, I laid down. And so John, um, being the scholar that he was and the reader, wanted to share his love for reading with me. So he read the whole trilogy of the Lord of the Rings to me during my first pregnancy. And um, we finished it up in the delivery room. And you know what? No, you're laughing, but listen to me. This girl, Rachel, has read the Lord of the Rings over 20 times and is finishing up her PhD in medieval literature. <laughs> so I know she heard him read that. All our kids love literature and love, love to read, but you know, her love for, for Tolkien is amazing. So I know that that, that bonding went in between, with her and me and her dad, because she and her dad have a very, very close relationship. And then nursing a child. First thing is, it's free. You know, I don't know why you wouldn't do that. John and I were grad he was a graduate student. We lived on no money. And when I had when I had a baby, we didn't have to buy food for the baby. You know, so I nursed as long as I could. And then well, you know, for about two years. And then the other thing is nursing the baby helps you lose your weight. That was another <laughs> great thing. I was 10 pounds smaller than before I got pregnant when I was nursing. The I practical loved it. side of the theology of the body. Why would you not do that? <laughs> I think it's natural. That's how God created us. So, but just the fact, the, the time, the bonding time, and you know, we live in such a busy, busy world where we're rushing around, we're trying to do, get our kids involved in everything. When you take the time to nurse, you need a quiet area. You need to sit and and relax and. To me, you know, the Lord is showing me the importance of silence in my life. And this was a time where I could bond with my baby. I could experience the love of God and share that with my child. You know, what, what a wonderful gift. And um, I see it now with my daughter-in-law. And I just, you know, I'm in awe that she, she's sharing that with, with my grandchildren. It's, it's a wonderful gift to be a mom, to, to carry a child, and to be able to nourish that child. So... So both John, St. John Paul II and now Pope Francis, um, who quotes John Paul II on this point, says men kind of find themselves on the outside of that process, right? They, they are outside of the bonds that are formed between their wife and their children during pregnancy and childbirth and uh, breastfeeding. So a man, John Paul, it's all good. Um, John Paul II says, has to learn his fatherhood from his wife. Um, and what he meant by that was 
a man has to kind of observe his wife and his children interacting and see those bonds and say, what can I do to add to this? What can I do to complement this instead of compete with it? And scientists tell us that what most men tend to do um, in, again, a, a family is men start to kind of help their wives supplement what those connections, those bonds, by helping their wives often with discipline and setting boundaries for children, but also promoting healthy risk taking with their children. Um, it's usually fathers who get down on the floor and wrestle with their kids. Yeah. Um, when we went to a playground when our kids were little, I was the monster who chased them all over the playground and chased them up and down the, uh, up and down the equipment, right? Claire played with our kids, but we found we played very differently, right? So <laughs> um, we like to say parenthood is on the job training because we read, when, when we were pregnant, we read books about how to be a good parent Sorry, you don't learn how to be a parent from reading books. Your kids teach you how to be a parent, right? So I learned by watching my wife interact with our kids, but then I also just learned by, do by doing and interact. And our, our kids are the ones who really taught us yeah. how to be parents and forgave us when, when we failed. Because we failed, we did um, along the way. <clears throat> Okay, so this picture on the left of Jesus washing St. Peter's foot, feet, um, this is a picture that is in our house. We, we have it, we just moved, so, but it used to be right on top of our fireplace um, in our family room. Now we have it in our dining room. But I, it, one of my daughters um, gave it to us a while back because she knew how important it, this was to us. First of all, when we um, were dating, we were both in Steubenville, and um, we knew that God wanted us to get married. And so the time came for John to propose to me, and he did a really nice job. So we came back as seniors in college, and I don't know if any of you have been to Franciscan University, but, um, well, it's not the most beautiful place. It's Steubenville is not the, the prettiest town. town. Yeah. The, the campus is pretty, but prettier now. We were there 35 years ago. But there, there aren't many beautiful places in the town. But there's a beautiful cemetery. So we... <laughs> so we're, we're not making this up. We're not making it up. So we used to love to, you know, run in the cemetery, or we, a lot of the students did. And so when we came back to campus after our summer break, John, um, we went to Mass together, and John said, let's go take a walk in the cemetery. And he had his backpack with him, and, you know, he didn't usually carry a backpack, but I didn't ask any questions. And we, t we took a little walk, and then after a while, he, he said, let's stop here. I want to show you something. And so he took out his backpack, and he had a towel in there, and he takes a bowl out of there, and he takes a jar of water, and he pours it in there. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, you may, and I know this is from the Bible. I can't quote it perfectly, but you may not understand what I'm doing now, but later you will. And, um, and so then he got down on his knees after he washed my feet. And he said, Claire, I would like to do this for the rest of my life. And I just said, will you marry me? So that's how we started our marriage, with John washing my feet. Little did we know that this would be what we would be doing for the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. Serving each other, serving our children, serving our friends and family. And so that's why, why we love this, this picture. So. And we've, we've really realized that at the heart of marriage, I mean, yeah, service is very much at the heart of marriage. That got our wedding gospel, that was also our wedding yes. gospel. Um, and it really was, it, was and is in a lot of ways a prophecy of our married life together, right? Because it, as Claire said, it is washing each other's feet. We've gone through, and we've been married 34 years now, we've gone through really difficult times. We've lost siblings to death. We both took care of our parents. Uh, my mom, Claire's uh, father and mother at the end of their lives, we were sandwich parents taking care of teenagers and elderly parents. Um, about 10, 12 years ago, I went through a really difficult time. I had two torn discs in my lower back, so I was in constant pain. I was battling depression, um, taking care of my mother at the end of our life. In the middle of that, Claire came down with an autoimmune disease. Um, and so not only were we limited in how we could take care of each other, but 
we had to rely on our children. Mm -hmm. And to our amazement, our teenage children really stepped up. Yeah, I like to talk about the suffering in our lives, the sickness and suffering as blessings because I really look at them as blessings. Not that I want to go back and do it again. I don't want to experience it again. But when I look at the, at the, the suffering, this, this time in our lives where we really did suffer. I, could, I mean, I was sick for almost a year when it was really bad that I couldn't, I couldn't um, drive. I couldn't um, do anything around the house. And John and the children just really stepped up and took care of me and loved me. And um, it was, I remember it was Christmas time and I had to go out and buy all the Christmas presents and my, my two sons who were teenagers took me shopping <clears throat> and came home and wrapped the presents. My daughters made all the Christmas cookies. It, it was just, it, you know, they, they reached out and took care of me like I had done for them. And, and I just thank God because it's during the time of suffering that we all came to see our need for the Lord. You know, we, we, we saw that we, we needed God in our lives and that we couldn't do this alone and we needed each other. Our family was a gift. And, and you know, again, I saw it. This is my mom. And um, I know she's up in heaven. She's a saint. She, she was a very holy woman. And I had her in, um, actually, no, I don't know where we are right now, but <laughs> she was in um, Sacred Heart Home in Hyattsville um, because it was close to campus where John teaches and where all the kids were. So I wanted them to be able to visit her. And um, the last year of her life was really beautiful. You know, my kids would come and visit her. Even the last week, I had, John and I were there every day, and um, one day my daughter Becca was there with us praying the chaplet, and then my son, my the younger son and his fiance came and prayed the rosary with her as she died. We actually um, had a couple Dominicans come over and and annoy her one the week before she died and then again the night before she died but the kids were part of it they saw that you know grandma wasn't leaving us for good she was going in to be in heaven to wait for us to hopefully that we would be with there but you know they really saw that this world yes we're, we're here to help each other we're here but we're here to guide each other and help each other get to heaven and that's where grandma was going. And even after she died, my children, from what they had learned, my oldest daughter took my phone and said, Mom, I'm going to call all your friends and family. And they went to the church and they, they told the, you know, got everything situated there. So John and I could really just concentrate on the funeral. The kids came home. My, my son from Charlotte came up, Paul and Jess and the kids, and they, and all five kids cleaned the house, took off the sheets, vacuumed everything, cleaner than it had ever been. And, um, <laughs> they got Certainly it ready. When they they lived prepared. There. You know, we're a family that loves to cook and to eat and to, to welcome people. So they, they cooked the meals. They did everything so that when Grandma's family and friends came, they were welcomed into our house. It was, it was really beautiful. And we just, we appreciate that, you know, we learn to serve and to love through our hard times and our suffering. And this is part of the theology of the body too, yeah. right? At the very end of the theology of the body catechesis, John Paul II said, you know, this doesn't just apply to marriage and religious life. It applies to suffering and death because this is also how we live the body. This is also how we give ourselves in love to others. Um, when Jesus says in Matthew 25, to the sheep on his right hand. When I was hungry and you gave me to eat and thirsty and you gave me to drink and in prison and you visited me, when we touch the bodies of others and love them and serve them and care for them, we touch Christ, right? And that's not just strangers when we do that. It can be members of our own family. We certainly experienced that when our kids cared for us through some of these difficult times. And, of course, the body is also integral when we pray. Yes. So, so this picture here on the left um, is me about a month after I got out of the hospital. I um, was sick with shingles in my head, and I didn't know it. So I spent a week in the hospital, and luckily the doctors told me afterwards that I could still go on our trip to Rome like four weeks later. So I was still um, suffering with some um, stuff that had happened to my eye and John and I were had the opportunity to go to an audience with Pope Francis 
And then we had the opportunity, we got picked to go up and, and meet freedom. him. And so, so I'm the talker. I'm the one who loves to meet people. Well, we got up there. I could, didn't know what to say. I couldn't speak. <laughs> so John, um, he, go ahead. I said, I introduced ourselves to the Holy Father, and I said, Holy Father, could you please pray for my wife because she's been sick? And without hesitation, he put his hand on her head, prayed over her, and I said, ooh, his English is a lot better than people think it is <laughs> because he didn't need a translator for that. So. But I like to call that picture the other Francis and Claire. <laughs> so that was a, very, a big blessing. But, you know, again, I... This here is a picture of our, our first um, grandson, Benedict Robert. And th not only did we do Paul and Jess's marriage preparation, we got to be his godparents. We didn't even know we were allowed to be. When they, when they asked us, John had to check this out. But, um, so here, check we, canon law. here we are at his baptism. And um, Father Hyacinth, I think you recognize Father Thomas Petrie. He, he was one of John's students, and he has become our family priest. He has baptized all three of our grandchildren. Um, we, I, I, this is the story I like to tell. We were at Father Thomas's um, ordination. Here at St. Dominic's. Yeah, so, so we got to participate in that sacrament. And then he has baptized all three of our grandchildren. He did the funeral mass for my mother, and he got to anoint her a week before she died. He... Um, Concelebrated and preached at one of our son's weddings. Um, so we've gone, I like to say we've, we've experienced all of the sacraments with Almost. him. Almost all of them. We haven't done confirmation yet. We have to wait someday, maybe when he's bishop, he'll, he'll confirm one of our grandchildren. Who knows? <laughs> so, but, but again, you know, he's part of our family. And the kids have grown, you know, have known him since they were in high school. And and he even comes over and plays cards with us, and he's he doesn't like to lose, but neither do we. So it's, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and really actually, next week he's coming over to bless our new house, and it's just part of life is having a priest, you know, there. And it's it, I think it's been such a blessing, and our grandchildren, you know, look forward to seeing him. But notice again how integral the body is when we pray, mm -hmm. right? When we when. Pope Francis prayed over Claire. He put his hand on her head. When we receive sacraments, right, we have our bodies washed in baptism. We have them anointed in confirmation in the sacrament of the sick. Our bodies are given in marriage or holy orders. And of course, we receive the body of Christ in the Eucharist. So again, the body is integral in our Christian lives, in the life of salvation. This is just a shot of our, uh, uh, so you can see the, fa you've been seeing the family down through the years. So this was last, uh, so a year this and a half ago. this is a year ago. and a half ago at our granddaughter's baptism. This is Eleanor Rose, so our little Nora. And what I like about this and what I like to share is that because, you know, we've, God has been a, the central part of our family and the sacraments have been so important. So Paul and Jess live down in Charlotte and they're the kind of parents that like to have their children baptized immediately. So Nora was born and within two weeks the baptism was planned and I was so proud of our other children. They they got off work, they got their airplane flights and they, you know, everybody was there for all three baptisms. And it just reminds me that they learned that the church, sacraments, family are a priority. And by the way, Father Thomas was there, but he he's not the in the picture because he took the picture. <laughs> um, so just to sum up um, what, we've, what we've touched on um, here tonight, and we want to leave some time for your questions and your comments, but um, if I have a favorite audience in all of the Theology of the Body Catechesis, it's July 4th, 1984. So that's why I put the date on here. So you can just look it up by date. John Paul II talks about how the liturgical language, the language, again, of the wedding vows, I take you to be my husband, wife, I promise to be true to you in good time and bad, is a prophecy of the whole of a couple's life together. The whole of their married life is learning what it means to live out those words. So again, the theology of the body isn't just a way to talk about sex. It, it certainly is. It gives a beautiful understanding, but it's much more. It's much deeper than that. The theology of the body involves 
everything we do in our bodies to give, receive, express love, serving, loving, caring, taking care of the sick, being with the dying. All of those things are how we live out the theology of the body, how we encounter the gift of the body in our everyday lives. And by the way, the theology of the body isn't something that John Paul II made up, right? The theology of the body, it's, it's in scripture. He gave us a way, he kind of brought it into focus for us, but St. Paul understands the theology of the body very well in, in his letter to the Corinthians chapter six. He talks about how our bodies have an eternal destiny, how our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. So what we do with our bodies matters. That's a metaphysical pun, by the way, your bodies matter, um, but your body has an eternal destiny, right? And you're, so the way we treat our body, the bodies of others, we're encountering living temples of the Holy Spirit. We're encountering the body of Christ on our journey to heaven. Right, and that's, that's the most important thing of, you know, we are all created, whether we are in a family, whether we're a priest, whether we're a nun, whatever God directs us to, we were all created to help each other get to heaven. That's our ultimate goal. And that's, you know, that's how we should live our lives, loving and serving each other and helping each other so we can rejoice in heaven together. So um, we, as Claire said, we're newbies to the world of social media, yeah. but one of our kids is serving as our social media director. So we now have a website. Woo! Um, we have our own email. You can follow Claire on Instagram, marriage.for.life. Um, and we're even on Twitter. Not that we know how to get on Twitter, we don't. but one of our children tweets things out for us uh, when, we <laughs> want to, when we want to use that form of social. I know, right? Uh, we're, yeah, if you saw my, never mind. Um, and then finally, uh, we've mentioned a couple of these books. So Raising Catholic Kids for Their Vocation, One Body. We actually have copies with us if you're interested. Um, and this is a book I came out about, um, uh, yeah, both Raising Catholic Kids and One Body. This we don't have copies of. It's a book I did about a year ago with one of my former doctoral students, a catechism for family life, just questions and 110 questions about different parts of family life with answers drawn from church right. teaching. So you can get all of them um, at Amazon or at TAN, a Mass Road or... CUA Press. Or we have those with us. You can save a little bit of money if you buy it today. We have them for $15, but you can also get them there too. So. Yeah. Whatever, whatever, if, you, if you're so, interested. Social media, books. We'll stop talking now and open the floor for your comments, questions. Thank you. So, so thank you so much, John and Claire. So I'll, I have a microphone with me, which I'll bring to those who would like to ask a question. Father Hyacinth will be playing Phil Donahue tonight. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. You spent over an hour supposedly theology of the body, and you've talked nothing about marriage and having, and having kids. What about everybody else? Where do those three elements of interacting uh, and having uh, having a satisfying life, having a full full life? Mm -hmm. Appreciate it if you'd spend some time talking about that. Sure. Um, so, no, that's that's a great point, and. I, again, I didn't do it justice in kind of the really quick overview that I gave, but John Paul II spends maybe a quarter of that catechesis talking about the vocation of um, consecrated life, religious celibacy, uh, consecrated virginity, um, and how those that's complementary to marriage. I will say what he doesn't spend as much time on and we need to spend more time on, especially in light of the recent synod on young people and young adults, is the vocation, what vocation do single Christians have, right? Because more people are spending more and more of their adult life as single people. People are living longer, so they might live after a spouse um, passes away. They might live for, for many years. People get married later. Some people don't get married at all. Especially inside the Beltway, you've got a much higher population. So do they, do they have a vocation? The they short don't. answer is absolutely yes. So right? how does that play out in the three elements then? The, okay. So, um, 
The three elements being those three original experiences, is that... The one on the left-hand side. Oh, the triptych. The creation, the... Praying. Oh, okay. Um, what I would say, that's a great question, and I'm going to go back to get the visual here to make sure literally we're on the same page. So, you're talking about here. No. The triptych. Well, no. I mean, that's, good that's good. That's good. Okay. So, okay. Um... Here, I would just say these dimensions of intimacy that we talked about are true of any form of friendship. Sexual intimacy is unique to marital friendship, right? But any authentic friendship is going to involve verbal, emotional uh, closeness, effect, expressing affection, and spiritual intimacy. But if we're talking about this anthropology, the theology of the body, Again, every person is created by God, called to a relationship by God. So sometimes when Claire and I give talks, we get the question, do single people have a vocation? And usually the question comes from young adults, right? And the answer is yes. Our voca every baptized okay. person has a vocation to holiness. Every baptized person has a vocation to follow Jesus Christ as a disciple and to form Christian friendships and to enter into Christian community with people who support them in living that out and who they support in living out that baptismal vocation. So every person is called to, to use John Paul II's terms, a covenant relationship with God. Everyone is called to friendship, community with others. The we're called to learn how to love in friendship and community with others. The complete gift of the body that's unique to marriage and celibacy or religious life. But, I mean, again, the body is integral to any form of human friendship. It's the basis of how we... If, if we go back here... I'm sorry, I'm jumping around here... Um, isn't it interesting that the body is involved in every one of these forms of intimacy? When we feel, um, wh when we express emotion, we're expressing in part bodily reaction. When we show affection, when we pray, you know, a lot of you were at the liturgy upstairs. When we pray, we sit, we stand, we kneel, we do all those things. We involve our bodies. Our body, in scripture, the body is the basis of all of our relationships with God and with other people. So that's true of every person, not just those who are married and have families. So that's a great question. I don't know if you wanted to add. Well, the there, only honey. thing I would add is that the I understand what you're saying, and I really, I think it's it's family's responsibility to include single people. Mm. To, you know, and that's what the parish is supposed to be. A family of families, parishes says Pope aren't Francis. Perfect, but I'm sorry that we haven't done that because it is our responsibility. Mm -hmm. And we are all called to holiness and through relationships and friendship. And we should be including single people as well as priests and nuns. And I was... I was able to go to a little bit of the Given conference that Claire mentioned, and one of the messages that, just in the little bit that I heard that came through very strongly is, every, these young women who are going through leadership training were told, your life is not on hold exactly. till you get married or you enter religious life. Your Christian life is not on hold. You're called to be living that now. How is the Lord calling you to serve now? So don't feel like you're just in limbo waiting for whatever the next thing is. Or you're missing out on something. God's plan for you is unique. Right. But so it is I, also I, our responsibility. I think in our culture that's a very important that. message. So. Great question. Hello. Hi. Hey, wonderful presentation. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, I, I read JP2's Love and Responsibility mm -hmm. and I took a lecture series on Theology of the Body. Good. And I don't get this, but did it come across in it as it did to me that he says to really reach absolute holiness is a married couple should be celibate to each other. No. Okay. Um, short answer. Um, I don't think I don't think he says that. Um, John Paul Voitiva in Love and Responsibility. John Paul II in his teaching. What he says is. Married couples to be holy are called to chastity, but chastity 
in marriage is not celibacy. Um, there are three things that he talks about, that the church talks about, that we need to distinguish and keep distinct. Continence, refraining from genital sex. All unmarried people in the church's understanding are called to practice continence. Celibate people or consecrated religious take a permanent vow of continence as a form of witness to the kingdom. Married people are called to live chastity, which is not continence. Chastity means fidelity in their sexual relationship and ordering their sexual relationship toward the expression of love and openness to life. Married couples who live, and for John, John Paul does say periodic continence is part of that. Whether a couple uses natural family planning, there are times in a married couple's life when they can't come together sexually, during illness, during when one's traveling, during times of separation. So continence, refraining from sex, is part of marriage, but not celibacy, not a permanent vow. Of, some married couples throughout history have felt called to live that. That's not John Paul II's recommendation. And certainly one of John Paul II's big goals uh, was we need to highlight what sanctity looks like in the married state. And so we just had the uh, Zelie and Louis Martin canonized together, the first married couple ever canonized simultaneously in 2015, right? So we can see lives of holiness, right? And they had a lot of children. They had, what, nine children and only five of them reached adulthood. So I and are probably all saints. Right so now there's at least two you know, that we know. One coming. Well, uh, what, another one is yes. her cause is going forward. But so, so no, I don't think holiness equals abs sexual abstinence in marriage. That's, I don't think that is John Paul's understanding. Holiness means the chaste expression of love. He does say at one point, only the chaste man or woman can fully love. But chastity in marriage looks different than chastity in the single life. It has a different form. Great question. The questions? No, he's just stretching. No, no. Uh, sorry. That was a stretch, not a hand. <clears throat> Sam, oh, I'll bring in the mic. So, my question uh, gets back to the icon iconography icons you were, were talking about. Um, and you or describe the theology of the body as we are the language. No, our body is a language, our, the language of the body. And I was wondering how we can be representative as an icon in that manner. It's a great question. Um, so, no, 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 but I actually want to go here. So there's an icon of Saints Joachim and Anne, whose feast day was on Friday. Right. Um, <clears throat> so this is my own definition. Um, so it's not I'm not necessarily uh, w willing to state it's it's absolutely spot on correct. But so a biblical and iconic anthropology, what is an icon? An icon is a theological representation of a mystery, a reality that's made present visually and artistically. So man and woman created in the image of God, right? Our body, John Paul II will actually call the body the primordial, a sacrament, a primordial sac, and marriage a primordial sacrament. Why? Because the body makes visible in the world, the human body, God's eternal design for creation, which is love. The human body makes in its sexually differentiated state as male and female makes visible to us the fact that God created us in love and God created us for love. God created us so that we could make a gift of ourselves to one another and to him. Um, so in that sense, yes, the body is an Icon. The human person is an icon. We are in the image and likeness of God. The Hebrew image, Selem, doesn't mean resemblance. It doesn't mean we look like God. It means that we make present 
something of God's authority within creation. And it means that we have the capacity, unlike the rest of the creatures of the visible world, the animals with whom we're also created and who also have bodies, we have the capacity to worship. That's why the first story of creation culminates in the Sabbath. On the seventh day, we have the capacity to give ourselves in worship to God. So the human body makes visible in the world our God's design for creation. Um, the letter to the Ephesians says that God uh, cre from before the beginning of time, God the Father purposed to create a people. Um, and draw them together in Christ who would live for the praise of his glory. The human body makes that mystery, and Paul uses that at the beginning of Ephesians, then he uses it specifically in regard to marriage in 532, um, uses that term specifically to describe um, God's plan and its unfolding in history. Um, Pope Francis has another, he puts, he has the same understanding, he puts it a little differently. He says, the family is the bearer of God's plan of salvation in history. God is always building a family, building a house, building up the people of Israel, right? God uses families with all of our brokenness, by the way, and messiness. Pope Benedict talks about this. God writes straight with crooked lines. That's why Matthew includes four women in Jesus's genealogy, all of them who are in irregular unions of one kind or another, to show that God uses families with all of our mess to bring about his plan of salvation in the world. So I, I do, that's, that's, what I'm, that's what I mean by icon. I also use the term icon because John Paul II uses the language of triptych to describe his, his vision of the human person. So that's, that's, it's also his term. So I feel a little safer. <laughs> Not totally going out on the limb there. So I actually have a question. So, um, of course, the one of the if it's it's one of the if not the most best selling books on marriage out there is the Five Love Languages of mm -hmm. Gary Chapman, and it's interesting that you have this uh, Protestant. I believe he's a minister. Uh, yes, um, with a, a background in psychology, a counselor. Yeah, and he discovered after working with couples for so many years this this insight, simple insight of the Five Love Languages and people's cry for love um, to receive love in in a certain way, but a, I mean, ultimately, in all five ways, mm -hmm. and of course, I think there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of parallels here and a lot of overlap. Yes, and I, I you know, when you were talking about your story, I, I was thinking about the proposal and the washing of the feet and all deeds, acts of service, but then also the words and and at different points, you can see all these different love languages. Yes. Um, was it a, maybe a year and a half ago, I gave a homily on Holy Thursday about the five love languages of Jesus and mm. the Last Supper. Mm. Um, wow. But I'm, I'm just wondering if, uh, and the one thing that occurs to me is that I think he's trying to connect, he as from a Christian background, he's also trying to connect to secular, a secular audience as well, mm -hmm. as, as well as Christian, uh, Christian couples. But one thing I think that's 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 emphasized here in the theology of the body is the sacramentality that all of these things, these five love languages, or can be vehicles of divine love. Yes, expressed through your human, your unique individuality yes. through these five different ways. And it's interesting that I think these things could come together in a beautiful way. I'm just interested in your thoughts. I, I'm sure you've thought about this the connections between theology of the body and the five love languages. So I have two thoughts and then I know Claire wants to chime in here uh -huh. and I can, well, maybe. I, can, I, I can think of a certain story that you like to tell when we work with couples um, in this regard. But so, I mean, whoops, I'm going the wrong direction. Sorry. Um, I can't navigate my own presentation here, but um, so in a sense, the, the five love languages can certainly enhance um, the and how many of you are familiar with Gary Chapman's five love languages? So looks like maybe a third of the room. So um, as Father Hyacinth said, um, Doctor uh, Doctor Chapman 
has written a number of books on these love languages. His idea is every person, yes, we need to give and receive love in all five of these ways, but every person tends to have a primary and a secondary of among these five where they, that Can is based tell what the five are? Th that's based on their personality and how they receive love as a child they are deeds of service right words of affirmation physical touch gift giving what's number 5 presents oh, oh no that's gifts quality time, quality. Quality time. That's thank what you I mean by presents that's quality. oh presents not present okay good <laughs> sorry i didn't catch the spelling good that's a, 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 that is hers um, so when we do marriage prep with couples we talk about these love languages and how uh, you really do kind of need to sh uh, to communicate in ways that your fiance, later your spouse, can receive as love. Um, Father Hyacinth, I think you make a really good point that, and I think this does ring true in our experience, that it's not just a human psychological disposition, but you can actually experience yes. the love of God through these modes. Mm -hmm. um, but Claire likes, likes to share a particular time when I really got this wrong. Um, but in it, it's interesting, Father. I never thought about the way John proposed to me as an, a give, you know, service. Yep. Now I, I see it, and it's I that, see it as well. And that is actually John's love language. Yep. He shows love, and by doing things for people, you know, he's he's he never sits. He's always serving someone, um, whether it's me or the family or stuff, someone at school. And um, that's the way he likes to receive receive love too. I'm not the best at giving that. I'm working on that. But for me, I love quality time. I love a relationship where the person is present to me and we spend time together. I love family game nights. I love you know my best kind of date is taking a walk together and and having you know cooking dinner together. I just I love quality time. So. Um, uh, 15 years ago, yep. 16 next week, um, it was my 40th birthday. Uh, so you can figure out how old I am. Going to be. So um, She said it, I didn't, I'm safe. <laughs> anyway, so, and um, you know, we have been going through a lot of these hard times and I just really wanted a family day. I love, we, we love to hike, we love to be together and um, all the kids, my birthday's in the summer so I always have everybody here. Everybody's coming in next week for my birthday and I love it. But um, I, you know, I kept telling John, I really want to just go hiking. I want to go up to Cunningham Falls and have a picnic and just enjoy the day. It was a Sunday, and that's all I wanted to do. And um, he kept saying, well, I can't come with you today, I, I, and I can't tell you why. And I was like, but it's my birthday. <laughs> I want to go. This is all I wanted. And he's like, how about you and the kids go? And I'll stay here. And, you know, and then he finally had, he said, Claire, I planned a surprise party for you. And I'm like, ah, why? I don't like crowds. Because it like, was her 40th. I like intimate things. So, you know, he was loving me in his way. Mm -hmm. And I wanted just quality time. So, <laughs> you really you have to know, you have to learn how, what right. makes, not just your spouse, your friends. Your children, you know, all our relationships, we need to realize that they don't receive love the same way we right. do. You so, know, and they don't experience God's love the same way we right. do. You know, and so, you know, there, there's different people that are going to help us get closer to the Lord by the way they live because they receive it our way, you know? Right. So Claire said to me, in the words of Vecini from The Princess Bride, you've committed one of the classic blunders. <laughs> um, because what I tried to do was show love in the way I received it, not in the way she received it. Right. And I think it was Aristotle who first said, that which is received is received according to the mode of the recipient. So I had to learn to speak her love language, not just speak with mine. It's a good life lesson for me. Um, I've tried to get I've tried to get better at it. This so, so. year, uh, my birthday happens to be the feast of Saint Dominic. So, and my grandson Leo Dominic is they're going to be here. They're coming on the seventh. So, I'm going to go to the zoo, and I'm, we're going to celebrate his feast day. It's going to be like the best day ever. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, some thoughts in in response to what is a really good question, Father. 
Well, thank you very much. I'm glad you quoted the Princess Bride because I, <laughs> yes. I, I, so when I when I took Dr. Grabowski's class, <laughs> I had never seen him before. I had never met him, and we're all sitting, you know, waiting for the class to begin. He was absolutely quiet. He was always very friendly and hospitable, but he was very quiet. And then we're all sitting there quiet, and he's just standing there. We're not sure what what he's going to say, what he's going to do. It was just it was a little bit of awkward silence. <laughs> and then we hear marriage. <laughs> marriage is what brings us together.